to the third presentation of the Foundation's Fall Series of the Arts and Humanities program. Tonight, we have Dr. Daniel Rollins, who's going to present Wasn't It Romantic? F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald and the Great Gatsby. At the end of his presentation, there will be an opportunity for Dr. Rollins to answer questions. You can post questions in the chat feature of YouTube. There are instructions uh, in there now that you can use to sign in and post those questions or comments. We're fortunate tonight to have introducing our speaker, Dr. Brandon Jenkins. He is Wayne Community College's Dean of Arts and Sciences and the recent recipient of the Foundation's Distinguished Chair Award. Dr. Jenkins will also act as moderator tonight. So at the end of Dr. Rollins' presentation, he will select your questions from the chat and ask them to our speaker. We hope you enjoy it. Good evening. On behalf of the Foundation of Wayne Community College, I would like to thank you for joining us this evening. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Daniel Rollins. Dr. Rollins is the department chair of the Language and Communications Department and is a current English faculty member here at Wayne Community College. Dr. Rollins is a previous recipient of the Bell Distinguished Chair Award and was able to travel across Europe during the summer of 2018. In addition to his work here at the college, Dr. Rollins serves as the pastor of Kenley Community Church in Kenley, North Carolina. I consider it a privilege to work alongside Dr. Rollins and to also call him my friend. I have no doubt that you will enjoy his lecture as he discusses the Fitzgeralds and the Great Gatsby. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins, and thank you to the Foundation for having me here tonight. Welcome to everyone who is live streaming at present and who will watch this uh, lecture later on. Now, you may be confused because, as Ms. Brow told you and as was advertised, the title of my presentation was supposed to be Wasn't It Romantic? F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald and the Great Gatsby. But if you leave a guy alone long enough with an idea, he's probably going to tinker with it. And the more that I considered their lives together in the Great Gatsby, which was his, uh, which was Fitzgerald's greatest novel, critically certainly, I changed the title to "We Have Never Been." What We Seemed, which is a direct quote from Zelda Fitzgerald, the mythological iconic romance of F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. Now, why would I do that? Well, when we consider The Great Gatsby, we certainly understand that it is the iconic novel that represents the riotous jazz age of the 1920s in both uh, America and Europe. And when we consider the status of the Fitzgeralds as a couple, we always think of them as the iconic love story of that age based on the revelry. They kind of represent the revelry and the exuberance, the wealth, the grandeur, and certainly the romance. But that image of them is a myth. In fact, that image that is mythological, was only established within about a year, maybe a little more, of their marriage and of their romance just before that. But we, we see them as that great romantic image and that great romantic couple. That's the way we project them and that's the way that we perceive them. But indeed, if the whole tale is told, they also become symbols of the destructive excess of the age. They are really a, a tragic pair who are ruined by infidelity, dissipation, and madness. A reputation they spent many more years earning than the romantic one 
that we associate them with. So let me tell you the story. And it begins in 1896. We see here young F. Scott Fitzgerald, who was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. His father was a failed salesman, but they, they had money. His family had money, and that money came from his mother's inheritance from her father, who was a wealthy grocer in the Midwest. And it always stuck with Fitzgerald that his family was never at the top of the social ladder. They lived on the best street in Minneapolis, but not in the best house. They, they had good, wealthy friends, but not the wealthiest friends. That, that, that delineation of status just marked him. And certainly we know that when he wrote The Great Gatsby, it becomes a theme of wanting to climb the social ladder. However, his mother's money did allow him to go to the Newman School, which was a prep school in New Jersey, and there he fell in love with New York City, and he fell in love with Princeton University, and he took the exams to get into Princeton, and he failed them. Even though he cheated, he still failed them. So on his 17th birthday, he met with the examining committee and schmoozed his way in because he, uh, he was a dapper young man and he was a smooth talker. So he does end up at Princeton and there you see him on the bottom left hand side. And for uh, the first couple of years, he does okay. He does climb the social ladder. He begins to write and he has some of his stories published in, in some of their uh, more well-known journals there. He even writes the lyrics to a musical called Fifi Fi which goes on the road and uh, he gets a, 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 stellar, a, a stellar review from the Baltimore Sun. So he understands he's going to be a writer. But it was in his first year at Princeton when he goes home for Christmas break that he meets the first love of his life, the very lovely Ginevra King who was from Lake Forest, Illinois. Her father was a wealthy banker, and as one writer says, she was very popular with the Ivy League boys. They fall in love, this couple does. They have a romance for about a year. We know that she comes to see him at Princeton. He takes her to homecoming. He takes her out in New York City. They go to the Ritz and they dine together. They go to a cabaret and a, and a, a Broadway play. So he's you know, really kind of putting on the Ritz for her, really wants uh, to be her beau. And he becomes her, her top suitor, you might say, even though she's still kind of dating other guys. But that relationship falls apart within about a year. And she falls in love with the son of another wealthy financier who becomes a World War I pilot. And that's interesting that it'd be a pilot. I'll tell you why momentarily. But at a party one time in Lake Forest, Fitzgerald hears someone as he's with Ginevra. He hears someone say, rich girls should never marry poor boys. And he knew they were talking about him. And that line finds its way into the great Gatsby when we have the whole relationship between Daisy Buchanan and Gatsby. But he loses the girl, he loses his first golden girl, and he decides that is never going to happen to him again. He's going to somehow make sure. He fails his junior year at Princeton. In fact, he does so badly, they won't let him be an English major anymore. You know, this great writer is not going to be an English major. But he comes back in 1917. He's going to repeat the year. But what happens in 1917 in America? We enter World War I. And he connives his way into being an officer. And here you see uh, the, the very handsome Lieutenant Fitzgerald. He uh, ends up being stationed at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And, and besides his military training, he begins to work on his first novel called The Romantic Egoist. And he sends a copy of it to a Scribner's publisher in New York, an editor named Max Perkins, who, by the way, will be his, per his editor for life, reads it and says, it's different, but it's not good enough to publish. You're going to need to work on it some. And so he's very encouraged by, by that letter he receives from Perkins. In the meantime, he is in his unit, the 667th Infantry Division, are shipped to Montgomery, Alabama. And all the Montgomery girls loved those Yankee officers. They thought they were sophisticated in ways that the Southern boys were not. So one night, Fitzgerald finds his way to the country club in Montgomery, and there's a dance going on, and he looks on the stage, and there's this young woman, 17-year-old girl, performing a ballet, and he is absolutely smitten. And the name of that girl was Zelda Sayre. 
Zelda Sayre came from society and she came from money. In fact, she was politically connected on both sides of her family, her mother and her father, both in Alabama and in Kentucky. In fact, her father was a judge and would become a Supreme Court Justice in Alabama. She was beautiful, she was young, she had honey golden hair, perfect skin, a svelte figure because she liked to swim and dive. And Fitzgerald walks up in his army uniform and his young good looks and introduces himself and by the way drops the name Francis Scott Key, who was a relative of Francis Scott Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald. And we know what Francis Scott Key did, right? He wrote the lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner. So he's trying to impress Zelda. She likes him. He likes her. But there's a problem. She is the golden belle of Montgomery. And her dance card, you might say, was full. In fact, young officers were at her door day and night wanting to court her. Young pilots would swoop down over her house to impress her. In fact, one of them crashed one time in a field nearby and it made the newspaper and she cut the article out and put it in her scrapbook. She was so impressed by this young man's daring do to impress her. Right? So Fitzgerald's got to figure out a way to get her attention. So he plans an 18th birthday party for her. He throws the party. They begin to, to communicate with each other and build a relationship. And soon they are falling in love. Uh, he's got to ship out, however. His unit gets called into active duty. They're going to send them up north to Hoboken, New Jersey, and then off to France where he's going to face combat. And he may possibly die. So what do they do? They consummate their relationship, with, they, they have, they're intimate with each other, they have this tearful goodbye at the train station, he leaves, she gives him a flask, by the way, as a, as a going away present, probably not a good start to their relationship, but he ships out, gets to Hoboken, and this is October 1917. Do we know what happens just a few days later, a few weeks later in November of 19, or I'm sorry, 1918? Do we know what happens? Yes, the armistice is signed. He doesn't go overseas. Instead, Fitzgerald ships back down to Montgomery where he's reunited with Zelda. They spend Christmas together. It's lovely because the Sayer home is beautiful and they're there snuggled up by the fire. They're falling in love with each other and they want to get married and they consider themselves engaged, but she says there is no way on earth I'm going to marry you because you do not have any what? Money. And I have to live with money. Now they are in love and they want the grandeur of New York together. They want to conquer the big city. But she realizes that they cannot do that with nothing. So he leaves. He goes to uh, New York City. He finds a job as an ad salesman and begins to write. And he gets rejected and rejected and rejected. And he does publish a couple of things. He sends her his mother's engagement ring. And she wears it one time. And she puts it away. In fact, she's courting and being courted by other young men. Interestingly enough, in 1919, Zelda Sayre is the homecoming queen at not one, not two, but three different Alabama universities that year. In fact, the Alabama football team had a fraternity called Zeta Sigma, ZS, Zelda Sayre. And the only way you could get initiated into the fraternity was if you'd had at least one date with Zelda Sayre. And of course, you know, it, it tears Fitzgerald's nerves all to pieces to know this is going on. Now, Zelda admits to uh, one of her friends, she says, you know, I don't really love Scott romantically, but I want to be his literary muse. So if he publishes something, I'll marry him because he's sweet. Fitzgerald, we know, makes three trips to uh, Montgomery, uh, one in April, one in May, one in June, to see Zelda. And after one of those trips, she says, oh, I, we're going to get married. In fact, we'll probably even die together, right? Yeah, young love, right? But when he goes in June, he, he does everything he can to convince her, you've got to marry me. He threatens, he cajoles, he begs, he pleads. He embarrasses himself 
She says, you've got to go. Here's your engagement ring. Go away. You're, you're, you're being silly. You've lost your confidence. Just This is over. Fitzgerald goes back to New York. He gets slobber knocked drunk. He's, for three weeks, he's on a drunk. Quits his job and moves back to St. Paul, uh, Minnesota, where he was from, and begins to write. He begins to rewrite The Romantic Egoist. He changes the title in July of 1919 to This Side of Paradise. Resubmits it to Scribner's. Perkins reads it and says, we're going to publish this. Now, Fitzgerald had not talked to Zelda in three or four months after she had kind of kicked him out. But now he's got a novel on the way. And so he contacts her and says, I'm a writer. I'm going to be published. Can I go see you? She says, yes. He goes down in November of 1919. She says, you know, on second thought, maybe I should marry you after all. I'm sorry for any misgivings, but I won't marry you until the books are in the bookstore. So in March of 1920, this side of paradise hits the bookshelves, the bookstores, and the first 3,000 copies sell out in just three days. It's an overnight success. Scott is famous overnight, and he's 23 years old. The announcement for their engagement appears six days later in the paper in Montgomery to a lot of people's surprise, including her family. They were shocked, including her friends. They were shocked, including two of her suitors. They were shocked because both of them thought that she was going to marry them. So she hustles up to New York, and on April 3rd, 1920, at the rectory of St. Patrick's Cathedral, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda Sayre get married. It's a no-frills wedding. They, they just kind of dress in their common clothes. There's no music. There, there are no flowers. There are no photographs. Her sisters, and she has three older sisters, do appear, but Scott doesn't buy them lunch afterwards, and they are greatly offended and hold it against him for the rest of his life. But after they're done with the wedding, they stroll up Fifth Avenue. They go to Scribner's bookstore and look in the window, and there are his books. And there's a sign that announces, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the youngest writer for whom Scribner's has ever published a novel. And he was at that point. They continue their stroll down Manhattan to the Biltmore Hotel, which they would later get kicked out of, but that's where they spend their honeymoon. Now we said that there's this great myth attached to this couple. They are the romantic couple of the jazz age. Well, certainly they were because he's 23, she's 19 years old, and they are celebrities. They are invited to all the best parties by all the best people. They ride around on the top of taxi cabs in New York City. They jump into uh, public fountains. She goes and, and, and trades her southern clothes for New York chic so she has new clothes and sometimes she likes to take them off in public because why? She's, they're, they're just young and they're free and they have no inhibitions. William Randolph Hearst actually assigned a reporter to follow them everywhere they went. That's how popular they were. But we have to understand that everything that they were doing was fueled at that time by alcohol. They were constantly drunk. They both liked to drink and they both liked to be drunk. But he needs solitude to write. So he shuts himself in at the Biltmore. She spends countless hours walking around the streets of New York City, which becomes a pattern for the rest of their marriage. Well, the, the, the parties, the craziness cannot go on and him continue to write. So they move to Westport, Connecticut, and there he writes, uh, begins working on a novel called The Beautiful and the Damned, which is about their first year of marriage. But they're starting to argue, and there are tensions, and they continue to drink. And they're having money issues. And they would have money issues for the, for the rest of their relationship. For the rest of Fitzgerald's life, uh, almost, he made uh, a habit out of uh, asking for credit from Scribner's and borrowing money from his agent, Harold Ober. And they would give until near the end of his life where they just wouldn't give him money anymore because he, he could never pay it back. But in the midst of this tension, suddenly on Valentine's Day of 1921, Zelda finds out that she is pregnant. 
And they do what every young pregnant couple in America would do at that point. They get on a very large ship called the Aquitania and they sail to Europe, right? That's what we'd all do, right? They go to Europe. He gets over there and Fitzgerald hates it. He goes to England, he goes to France, and he makes the comment to a friend. He says, you know, America just should have left it to the Germans and let them have their way with it. That's how badly he hated uh, Europe. So eventually they come back home. They go to St. Paul, where he's from. They settle in so they can have the baby. And on uh, October 26, 1921, Francis Scott, Scotty Fitzgerald, is born. That's not the name that Zelda wanted to call her. She wanted to call her Patricia, but she was under anesthesia. So Scott Fitzgerald named the baby after himself and always called her Scotty. But for the first about 10 years of her life, Zelda called the baby Pat. So she was called, how schizophrenic was that, right? She was called by two different names. But Zelda's first words out of the anesthesia were these. She said that she hoped her daughter would be beautiful, but she hoped she'd be a fool. And of course, Fitzgerald hears that, and that line too makes it into the great Gatsby off the lips of Daisy Buchanan. The Beautiful and the Dam is, is published in 19, early 1922. And Fitzgerald is very upset because it is not a commercial success. It's really a commercial failure. She is upset because when she reads it, she realizes that he's written about her life. He's written using her letters to him. In fact, she finds that her diaries, which suddenly disappeared one day, have found their way into his work. That would also be a habit and a theme throughout their marriage, as he wrote. But in 1922, they find themselves living in Great Neck, Long Island, New York. And there they, they hung out with show business people. They hung out with bootleggers. They, they entertained lavishly and went to a lot of parties with celebrities. And, and Fitzgerald would sit on the porch of his friend Ring Lardner's house. And they would look over at this large house called Land's Inn, which at the time was owned by Herbert Swope. And if you know anything about the Great Gatsby, you can look at that house and understand that the, the, the machine was clicking inside Fitzgerald's home or in his head because at this home, Herbert Swope would host these huge parties with all these show business people, all, just crowds of people coming from New York City. And as we know, this becomes an inspiration for the Great Gatsby, which he begins to work on in Great Neck during 1922. He also met a man there named Max von Gerlach, who was a yachtsman which was euphemism for bootlegger at the time because this is prohibition, right? But he had written a letter to the Fitzgeralds and used the term old sport, old sport in it. And that line too found its way into Gatsby on the lips of who? Gatsby all the time addressed people as old sport. Well, Fitzgerald's finding it hard to write here in Great Neck. He always finds it hard to write places. He constantly is on the move. So the couple goes back to Europe, Paris first, and then they end up on the Riviera uh, at St. Raphael at a house called the Villa Marie. And there Fitzgerald closes himself in and he is going to write. Now, <laughs> Fitzgerald believed that male semen contained fluid substances that enhanced creativity. So he began to forbid her his sexual pleasure, you might say. He wouldn't have sex with his wife. So she's wandering around the beaches of the Riviera lonely while he's locked in the Villa Marie writing his book. And there she goes into some bars, and in one of the bars she meets some uh, French airmen who are from a local base. And for the next part of our story, we will call it the Josanne Affair. Because one of the people that she meets is a pilot named Edouard Josanne. He is 25 years old. He is a manly man. He is very confident in himself. He's a pilot. He flies around. He is rugged. He is everything her husband is not. 
And they become close friends. And guess what he does? He's a pilot. So he starts to swoop over her home in his airplane, just like those pilots in Montgomery had done that she was so impressed by. And they start sunning themselves on the beach and, and things you know, are very innocent to begin with. And suddenly they, there's a, a full-blown uh, affair going on, a romantic affair between Zelda Fitzgerald and Edward Ed Josan. And the Fitzgeralds have good friends in the area and all the friends know about it. But Scott knows nothing about it. They keep it from him. Nobody will say anything to him. But in July of 1924, something happens that Fitzgerald called the big crisis. Zelda comes to him and says, I want a divorce. Edward is coming for me and I'm going to leave and I, I want a divorce. And Scott says, all right, well, tell him to come see me. There's going to be a confrontation. The problem is there was a language barrier between Edward and Zelda. He spoke no English. In fact, she was the first American woman he had ever met. And she spoke basically restaurant French. Edouard did not want a wife. He wanted a mistress, and that's what he had. So when she says, you've got to come for me and take me away from my husband, Edouard went, yeah, no, no. I'm not, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that, right? And so the confrontation never happens. But again, even that confrontation, that, that potential finds its way into the great Gatsby with the confrontation between Daisy's husband, Tom, and Gatsby, which, which never occurs in real life. So how does Fitzgerald react to this? First, he locks Zelda away in the house, forbids her to go anywhere, and she won't. She doesn't. But he says this, he says, I knew something had happened between us that could never be repaired. In fact, he lost the illusion of the certainty of Zelda's love, and he was devastated by her betrayal of him. As far as Zelda was concerned, she became very sick, anxious. Her, her breathing became troubled. She was sleepless. Her face became very haggard. She began to have digestive problems. She tried to commit suicide over this. And in fact, she told people that because the, the, uh, the affair was hopeless, that Edward himself had committed suicide, which was not true. Edward Josan had a very distinguished military career. He was at Dunkirk, as a matter of fact, with the French Navy. He was the vice admiral of the French fleet in the 1950s uh, in the Far East. So he was very distinguished. He didn't commit suicide at all. But back in Paris... Fitzgerald meets Hemingway and recounts the story over and over. And Hemingway reports, he said he was very troubled by what happened. Zelda tells Hemingway's wife, Hadley. And by the way, Hemingway and Zelda hated each other with this just huge intensity. right? In fact, Hemingway had told Scott, you ought to leave her. You ought to just dump her and get rid of her. She's a problem. But Zelda told Hemingway's wife, Hadley, she says, listen... This is the story. I'm going to tell you the story of what happened. And she does, in front of her husband. And makes up the whole thing about Edward committing suicide. And Fitzgerald is sitting there adding to the story. Making it up as fiction as they went along. Again, something thematic. He felt he owned their common story, which will become a problem in their relationship later on. But in 1925, he does published The Great Gatsby. And while it, is, it gets very good reviews, the sales are very, very poor. It's a commercial failure. But it allowed him to be cathartic. In fact, he, he recounts his courtship both with Ginevra King and with Zelda. He recounts the breakup with Zelda, the restoration of, of that relationship, her betrayal of him. They finally leave Europe after two and a half years. They go home, but their lives are changed permanently. They are, they're, they're disorganized as a couple. They, they're permanent strains on their relationship. And by this time, he has been drinking so much that he is an acknowledged alcoholic. So they settle, they, they do a short stint in Hollywood, and he fails as a screenwriter but mostly because they were going to parties and drinking all the time. But he does meet this little actress, this young actress called Lois Moran, and nobody is ever seems to be sure if they had a romantic relationship or if it was platonic, but he was constantly throwing Lois Moran in Zelda's face because of what had happened. 
with Josanne. But they go back east, they settle in Wilmington, Delaware, at a house called Ellersby. And there, Zelda, who, who by the way would write some things later on, wants to take up ballet. She wants something for herself. She says, you know, I'm not just going to be your wife, Scott. I want something for me. So she travels to Philadelphia three days a week, and she takes private lessons or lessons with a woman named Catherine Littlefield, who had studied with Lubav Egorova, Egorova in Paris. I'll talk about Egorova in a moment. But she goes three days a week, and she found, uh, Zelda did this large mirror at this sale somewhere. And she took the mirror, and she put it in uh, their salon at, at Ellersby, and she would dance in front of this mirror for hours a day. Fitzgerald called it her whorehouse mirror. And he was constantly berating her about her dancing. He was never supportive of her dancing. But after only a few months, in April 1928, they go back to Paris again. As you, you can see, they're always unsettled. They're always restless. And Zelda seeks out Lubav Egorova, who was the head of the ballet of the Diaghilev uh, troupe, which was a famous Russian ballet troupe. She, uh, Egorova was renowned and starts taking lessons. And Zelda starts dancing eight hours a day, every day, to become a prima ballerina. My friends, prima ballerinas don't start developing at 27 years old. They start developing at 7 years old. But she's dancing herself into a frenzy. In fact, a friend went to see her and described her as terrible. He said that the, her intensity was actually just grotesque to watch. But she did get an opportunity lined up by Egorova to dance with the San Carlo Ballet in Naples. But she wouldn't take it. She was scared to leave Scotty with Scott because he was drinking all the time. She was scared Scott would leave her and divorce her and she didn't have any income coming in at all. He needed her support. She wondered if she was trained well enough to really take the part, but she turned it down. Egorova is furious with her with Zelda, and Zelda falls into this great depression. In fact, one night as she's traveling back to Paris from somewhere with, with Scott, he's driving near a cliff, she grabs the steering wheel, shouts, God's will, yanks it towards the cliff, he recovers, stops the car, Scotty, the little daughter, is in the back, her eyes are wide open because Zelda almost killed all three of them. By the fall and winter of 29 and 30, the ballet and her intensity are, are causing some, some mental problems. She becomes paranoid. She suffers from insomnia. She begins to have bad dreams. She goes to the local market and the flowers begin to talk with her and talk to her with threatening voices. And she desperately wanted Egorova's approval to the point where she almost worshipped the woman. Just after Easter in 1930, she shows up at Egorova's studio one day in mental collapse. Egorova gets in touch with Scott and says that you must have her evaluated quickly. And Scott does. He takes her to the house Malmaison in France to have her uh, checked out. She hadn't slept in days. She's agitated. She's pacing. She's begging to go back to Egorova. And she's a little bit drunk. They diagnose her correctly, by the way, with nervous ex exhaustion. He takes her home, Scott does, but she doesn't get any better. So he takes her to the Valmont Clinic in Switzerland. And let me just kind of read to you her diagnosis. This is what one person noted. She has no appetite. She's depressed. She's quarrelsome. She's rude to old friends. She drinks heavily and collapses. She's developed a curious horror of people, which produces a shrinking away from people. She becomes silent to friends. She is pale and shaken in stores. She is abnormally quiet with sudden outbursts of despair. She hums to herself all the time, yet music is her only pleasure. She's in a state of hysteria quite often. She hears voices. She imagines people are criticizing her, and then she makes scenes about it. She's unable to face shopkeepers and servants. She sleeps a good deal and honestly wants to die. She cannot let Scott out of her sight. 
There is a complete lack of control on her part. She picks at her fingers. And, and this person discerns that her capacity to hold liquor, which she loves, is diminishing. Writing becomes a labor. And she was once a great reader and no longer reads. And she is diagnosed then with schizophrenia. Probably a misdiagnosis, but a diagnosis that would scar her and stain her and mar her for the rest of her life. But she's not getting well mentally, so in June of 1930, Fitzgerald places her in a place called Prangens Institute in Switzerland. And she, she says this later on, she writes this. She says she considered the drive there the end of her life. And this is what she wrote. Our ride to Switzerland was very sad, it seemed to me like we did not have each other or anything else, and it hath killed me to give up all the work I had done. I was completely insane and had made a decision to abandon the ballet and live quietly with my husband. I had wanted to destroy the picture of Egorova that I had lived with for four years and give away my tutus and the suitcase full of shoes and free my mind of the thing. The light in which the thing presented itself to me was... I had got to the end of my physical resources. If I couldn't be great, it wasn't worth going on with. Though I loved my work to the point of obsession, it was all I had in the world at the time. She's in Prangins and she begs Scott. She says, will you please contact Egorova and just ask her if I can be a great dancer? And Scott does, and Egorova writes back and says she could be a good dancer. She could dance in, you know, anywhere across Europe and America that she wants to, probably in the chorus. She may have solos, but she will never be a great dancer. She is too old, and my younger students are far better. When Zelda received that news, she packed up her tutus, she packed up her ballet slippers, put them away, and never danced seriously again. In January of, that, of 1931, Scott's father died back in the United States, and though he wasn't close to him, he came to America for the funeral. And by the time he got back to see Zelda in February of 1931, she was actually much better. She was very hopeful. She began to write him love letters again. They would go out and go shopping, or they could go to dinner together, and she would return to Prangins overnight. And then finally, after 15 months of treatment, she is released from Prangins Institute. Ironically, the couple decides to go back to America and to go to Montgomery. They board the Aquitania, the ship that had first taken them to Europe when they were so full of hope and she was full of child. They had lived, in, they had lived abroad for four and a half years. Twenty-two of those months they had lived in Paris. But after they sailed to America this time, they would never return to Europe. Zelda was 31 years old. Eczema had coarsened her skin. She, her face was strained. Her, her youthful beauty was absolutely gone. Her hair, which was just golden honey and beautiful, she pulled back. It was no longer stylish. She just pulled it back with a beret, and her face was just suffering or showed the suffering of despair. But even more so, she would never, ever not only return to Europe, but she would never, ever, ever forgive Scott for placing her in an institution. They go to Montgomery, they settle down, things seem to be going well, she's getting better. Her father, who she was not really close to, but she does care for, dies during that time. But she's so well, they decide to take a trip to St. Petersburg. They go down to St. Petersburg, Florida, they have a lovely time. But on the way back, he falls asleep in, in the hotel room and she finds his flask and drinks every drop of it. She begins to go into hysteria. There, there are things that are after her. She wakes him up. He can't calm her down. He finally gets her back to Montgomery. They do get her calm enough but by giving her morphine that she settles in, but she continues to have these episodes, and only morphine will calm her down. So finally he places her back into another institution, this time at the Middle Institution at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And there she meets a woman who is an attending physician named Mildred Taylor Squires. Squires gets permission for Zelda to write two hours a day, every day. And in eight weeks, 
Eight weeks writing two hours a day, Zelda produces a novel which drives Scott crazy. How can she do that when he's just laboring? He hasn't written anything since The Great Gatsby. This is like five, six, seven, seven years later. He's just writing short stories to pay the bills. Plus, she submits it to Scribner's and Max Perkins says, we can probably publish that. She did it without Fitzgerald knowing. He is furious. He writes to Squires. He says, what did you allow her to do? He writes to Perkins and says, she can't publish this novel. That's my information in there. That all that stuff that happened in Switzerland, that's mine. All that stuff in, her, in, in the relationship that we experienced together, that's mine. Because after all, I was trying to write hack stories to pay the bills while I was paying for her to be in the institution. So essentially, I own her labor. Wow. How arrogant is that? But what they decide to do is they say, okay, Scott, you can help her with the rewrites. He takes out all the stuff that he wants to put in his next novel, but they do get it published. And on October 7th, 1932, she publishes Save Me the Walls. I'll confess, I've read all his novels and many of his short stories. I tried to read it. I couldn't. It's the most verbose thing that you've ever read. It actually did not do very well at all. Because, well, there, and there are several reasons why. It was edited very, very poorly, but also there was, there was no promo budget. There was no distribution plan. That was all Scott's idea. He wanted that novel to fail, and it did. In fact, that novel earned her a whopping total of $120.73. She, again, is devastated. Just a couple of years later, though, after, after, this, after she publishes Save Me the Waltz, he publishes Tender is the Night. And what is in Tender is the Night? All of the information that she wanted to use in Save Me the Waltz. He had forbidden her to use anything that happened to them in Switzerland, anything that happened. She couldn't write about anything psychiatric whatsoever. And if she did, he threatened to sue her because she was planning a second novel. He said, I'll sue you and I'll divorce you. And his divorce lawyer, by the way, was Edgar Allan Poe Jr. How, how literary is that? In fact, he had a plan to send, to do something to send her into great despair. Nobody ever said what that was. But he was going to drive her mad again so that she wouldn't steal the information that he thought was actually his. Wow. Wow. She never gets any better after this uh, psychically. He has to put her into another mental institution in Baltimore. And it was during this time that he finally decides she is never really going to recover. We're never going to have a normal life together again. So in the summers of 1935 and 1936, he finds himself in the mountains of North Carolina. He's in Hendersonville, he's in uh, Tryon, and he stays at the Grove Park Inn, as you see here, which we know is in Asheville. And he meets a woman named Lori Guthrie Hearn. Hearn becomes his secretary and his confidant. And this is what he says about Zelda. He calls Zelda his invalid. His invalid. But he wondered aloud to her many times if he and his drunkenness and his demands and locking her away and not allowing her to have a life and to be able to express herself had caused her breakdown. He was absolutely haunted by it, she said, or he said. But then he called their marriage this. This is, this is beautiful, but also how arrogant is this statement? He called his marriage to Zelda the mating of the age. She was the golden beauty of the South, and he was the brilliant success of the North. And he loved her so much that he entered into a romantic affair with someone named Beatrice Dance, whose husband had to come from Texas and take her away because she wanted a relationship with Scott. And he was like, no, kind of like Josanne, he just wanted an affair. And by the way, that was not his first affair. He had many affairs with other women while his wife was institutionalized. Well, she's not getting better in Baltimore, so finally her sister and brother-in-law intervene on Zelda's behalf, and they move her to a hospital in Asheville called Highland. She arrives in April 1936 with very few belongings. She's hysterical, 
and she's having hallucinations. But a Dr. Carol who started Highland had this program and she actually began to get better. And, and she was able after a while to visit with Scott at the Grove Park a few times and they would have lunch together. But it was curious because they would sit away from everybody. They were COVID before COVID was cool, right? So they sit away from everybody. They never talk to each other and he never introduces her to anyone at the Grove Park Inn. How sad is that? And this, at, during this time, understand, he's broke. He's $40,000 in debt. His books are all out of print. He's making no money. And because of his alcoholism, he is having trouble writing. And yet at Highland, a psychiatrist interviewed them, and he said, look, I was impressed by their shared intimacy. They could go from anger to laughter to anger in a matter of seconds. It was like they were just simpatico, like they were one. In 1937, Fitzgerald gets an opportunity, and this would be his third one, to go to Hollywood. And he had failed as a screenwriter before, but he, is, he signs a contract. Listen to this. He signs a contract with MGM for six months for $1,000 a week. This is the 1930s. That's good money. That's good money now for some of us sitting in the audience. Yes, that's good money. $1,000 a week. He goes there and he meets a woman named Sheila Graham, who was a gossip columnist. She was very beautiful. He did not, she did not know who he was. She had never read one word he had ever written. But she found him very charming and she liked him and they began a romantic relationship. He told Zelda that he was in Hollywood, but never told her where he lived. If she wrote him letters, she had to send, him through, send the letters through his agent. That's how they communicated. He never told her about Sheila Graham, even though they had a relationship of three years. But in 1938, Zelda says, well, I want a family reunion. Let's meet in Virginia Beach. We'll, we'll get together with Scotty, who by this time is eight, uh, 17, 16 years old, right? We'll get together. We'll have a nice uh, reunion. But they arrive there, and, and during the course of their reunion, they get so angry with each other, Scott and Zelda do, right, that they retreat into what they know. What do they know? They know the bar. They find the bar. They go to the bar. They both get drunk. He is wandering up and down the halls, right? He's slobber knocked out. He's just drunk. He's, you know, manic. And she's wandering the halls too, going, there's a madman in the hotel. Somebody better do something about it. The police are called. And he has one heck of a time convincing them that he's not the one who's crazy, that she's the one who's been institutionalized. But finally, they leave uh, Virginia Beach and they will not see each other again for a year. In that year, he continues his romance with Sheila Graham. But in April of 39, they split. There's this, they had this angry fight. He's drunk, threatens to kill himself. She says, go ahead, shoot yourself, I don't care. He says, well, I'm not, but I'm leaving. He leaves, he goes to Zelda. They plan a trip to Havana, Cuba. He's drunk on the airplane. He's drinking on the airplane. He's drunk all the way. He's drinking all the way to Havana. They get to the hotel he wants to go out in Havana. Zelda wants to stay in the hotel because she's also suffering from religious mania. So she's going to stay in and pray. He goes out in the streets of Havana, finds a cockfight, tries to break it up and stop it. The people there beat him so badly, he, I mean, he's wounded, that she, Zelda, has to get them both back on a plane to New York City. They get off the plane, they take a cab, they go to the Algonquin Hotel. He gets out of the cab, tries to fight the cab driver. She finally gets him there to the Algonquin. He ends up in the hospital. Uh, she goes back to Asheville alone, alone. She gets checked into the hospital, right? Uh, she ends up back in Highland telling everyone what a lovely time they had. But this, this episode, this drunken brawl that they really get into, her taking care of him, him being abusive really verbally to her and, and, and emotionally to her, was, was very kind of exemplary for the last several years of their life. In fact, after she left him in New York City, 
at the Algonquin and goes back to Highland, she will never see him again. But he does write her the next month, and listen to what he says. You are the finest, loveliest, tenderest, most beautiful, beautiful person I have ever known. But even that is an understatement because the length that you went to there, meaning in New York, in the end would have tried anybody beyond endurance. Wow. You're the finest, loveliest, tenderest, most beautiful person I have ever known. And even in his love for her, he reconciles with Sheila. He, he, he reconciles that relationship. Zelda finally writes him and says, Look, I know that we'll probably never be reunited, but I want to live on my own. I want to go home to my mama. I want to go to Montgomery. She and her mother were, were very, very close. He doesn't want her to get out. He says, in fact, the only way I'll do that is if I divorce you because I'm not going to be to blame if something goes wrong with you. Your family is not going to blame me for it. But that divorce never takes place. And even though he had written that very tender letter to her in May, just a few months later, he writes her again saying that he didn't love her when he married her. He didn't love her again until she was pregnant. He accused her, he accused her of being a drunk and says that he wanted to make something of her beauty and her defiant intelligence, unlike her mother. And he says that he failed at it and wants to know why her family thinks that he drove her crazy, which they did think that, when she could have left him at any time. But it was never that simple for her. But finally, Dr. Carroll at Highland consented to her release and in April of 1940, Zelda boards a bus from Montgomery. She had been at Highland Hospital for four years and one month. She arrives in Montgomery and things change for her. As you can imagine, after 20 years, she's no longer invited to parties. No one really seems interested in her. And it's very clear to her that her estrangement from Scott is all but complete. Scott remains in Hollywood for the last years of his life. In November of 1940, he suffers a massive heart attack and he actually moves in with Sheila. They had never lived together. They had always had their own homes separate from each other. But he moves in so she can take care of him and writes to Zelda and you know, minimalizes his condition. I'm not that bad. But he wrote a letter to Scotty, his daughter, and he says, you know, you had the two worst parents anybody could have ever had. Here's my advice to you. Just do everything we didn't do, and you will be okay. On Friday, December 20th, he has an appointment with a doctor, but he cancels it because he's working on a new novel. It's going to be his masterpiece. He's going to call it The Love of the Last Tycoon. He's about halfway finished with it. He's working diligently on it. But that night, he and Sheila go to eat, and then they go to a movie premiere called This Thing Called Love. And at the end of the movie, he gets up and he gets very, very dizzy. He loses his balance and has trouble getting back to the car. She says, let's go to the doctor. He says, no, he's coming tomorrow. Just take me home. I'll be okay. She takes him home. He goes to sleep. The next morning, he gets up. He's feeling good. That afternoon, he is sitting in her house by the fireplace. He is reading the Princeton Review, you know, where he went to college. He's making notes about the football team. When suddenly, he stands up, he grabs hold of the mantle of the fireplace, pauses for a minute, and falls dead onto the floor. She tries to revive him. She calls people to revive him. But the, by the time uh, that, that whatever you would call that era's EMS are there, he's dead. He's 44 years old, still a young man. It's December 21st, the shortest day of the year that year, by the way. And if you know about the great Gatsby, what happens to, to Daisy? She says, do you ever look for the longest day of the year and then miss it? A line full of hope and yet tragedy. And here, ironically, he dies on the shortest day of the year in 1940. His body was shipped back east. 25 or 30 of his friends are there at uh, the Episcopal Union Cemetery in Rockville. It's a rainy, cold day, December 27th, and he is buried. And tragically, the woman he loves, Zelda, can't come to the funeral. 
and is not there with him to lay him to rest. The woman he is learning to love, Sheila, will not go to the funeral in deference to Zelda. Zelda spent the last years of her life in Montgomery. She painted, she wrote, she took long walks often with her Bible. But the most famous of Montgomery's southern bells returned home to live as an impoverished invalid, basically. World War II rolls around. Soldiers are stationed in Montgomery again. She is at the Red Cross folding badges. But there are no more suitors who come to see Zelda Sayre, Zelda Fitzgerald. They no longer come from the depots. They're no longer hanging around her house or flying sorties over her rooftop. Someone says that she had just lost any spark of excitement in her life, and they described her as if she were almost a lifeless, faded, wax figure. She did go to New York City a couple of times. Scotty had some grandkids for her. She was there, but always had very anxious moments and would come back to Montgomery and soon find herself at Highland again. She would check herself in. In November of 1947, she decided again to go to Highland for some treatment and for some rest, and a taxi was called to pick her up. And there she is waiting for the taxi in front of her house. Her mama, who she loves so much, is there. Her sister Marjorie is there. Her childhood friend Livy Hart is there. And, and the taxi pulls up and they say their goodbyes. And as she starts to get into the taxi, she stops. And she turns around. And she goes back to her mama. And she says, Mama, don't worry. I'm not afraid to die. She gets in the taxi and goes to Highland. She undergoes insulin shock treatment, and after about four months, she seems to be getting better, and they're going to release her, and she decides to stay one more week, and that would become a tragic decision. Because on March 10th, 1948, the five-story building in which she is residing at Highland catches on fire. She's staying on the fifth floor. It's a wooden structure, so immediately the fire escapes burn away. The windows are screened. The doors are locked. The place is going up in flames. To make it worse, the patients there have been given sedatives to help them sleep between 9 and 11 o'clock, and this was around midnight. So they're, they're kind of out of it. The firemen don't show up to, for 45 minutes, there was no warning bell, there's no sprinkler. Those women are caught in that building. The firemen finally hack their way inside. They're rescuing people. People, women are, are wandering off into the woods. They're having to go get them. People say that they heard screams from people who were inside this, this inferno at Highland on that night. There were 10 women who were housed on the fifth floor. Nine of them lost their lives when the building completely collapsed. Only one of them, Allison Carter, survived, and she jumped five stories to save her life. She was permanently injured, and she and her family sued Highland because, number one, in that building, on that, that treatment mall, as, as we might call it, the, the windows were not supposed to be screened. The doors were not supposed to be locked. And, and with 20, I think it's 29, 49 women in, in the whole building, there were two nurses. One of them was in training. And one, the head nurse that night, was a former patient at Highland who later confessed and said, you know, I probably started that fire. But Zelda Sayers remains were charred and were only recognized by the bed where she might have been sleeping and by a pink slipper that they found under her remains. Her body was sent back to actually to Rockville, to the mortician who had buried Scott. And they were laid to rest together in Rockville. And so... What, what can we say about this couple? Well, it's probably easier for us just to let them speak for themselves. 
Zelda said this at one point, I don't need anything except hope, which I can't find by looking backwards or forwards. So I suppose the thing is to shut my eyes. And of course, if we could hear Fitzgerald speak, Fitzgerald, who was so addicted to her or to his love for her, would probably say this from the great Gatsby. So we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. And so we see that our vision of the Fitzgeralds as the romantic couple of the 1920s possibly is true, but is also a myth. Because the greater story of their lives is, 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 is one that, where they were just destroyed and become a symbol of the excess of that period. Very much in love with each other, very much addicted to each other, but they destroyed each other as well. Thank you for your time tonight, and thank you for listening. I believe that my colleague says that we may have some questions, and I'll, I'll try to answer them if you'd like to ask, Dr. Jenkins. question is how did their daughter turn out their daughter turned out okay she had a normal life she wouldn't have so much to do with her mother um, because she was afraid of her mother especially being around her children um, of course her, her mother died when um, you know Scotty was still young um, to, to kind of understand when when Scott was sober he was a doting father he taught her many things and loved to play with her. But during her life, Zelda never spent a lot of time with Scotty. Did not like that relationship. Did not want that relationship. Didn't really like being around her until you know, Scotty had grandkids. She ended up getting cancer. Uh, that, uh, she married Welt, actually, but ended up getting cancer and died sometime in the 1980s. Next question is, if we know that this side of a paradise is filled with her writings, why isn't she given credit as an author now? Um, so, she, okay, ask the question one more time. If we know that this side of paradise yeah. is filled with her writings, why isn't she given credit as an author now? Well, here's the deal. And it's, fair, it's a great question, and here's why. She actually published her own writings. It, it was her stuff. She wrote it. He might look at it to help her edit it, but she published. But it was never, well, it was a couple of times under her own byline, but lots of times, especially early on, there was a joint byline. It was his name first and her name second. And part of that was not, look, you know, this is my story, I own it from his part. It was, this will sell better if F. Scott Fitzgerald's name is on it. So there were times where she did publish and, and, and she did get her own byline, but he was the money maker in that family. And, and so even while that was her diaries, he was taking credit for being the artist that he would have never allow her to be. What sparked your interest in the Fitzgeralds? I mean, I'm an English major, you know, and, and so you read The Great Gatsby, and, and, and I guess it's personal. I, I read it one night while I was alone, uh, I was at the beach, and, and we were staying in a beach house on the ocean. That is a personal story. But everybody who was with me had gone to bed, and I had never read it. And I read it, and I could hear the ocean. You know, you just associate things. And it was a romantic tale. I didn't, I didn't understand everything about it, but I read it. And so that memory always stayed with me. But I think what interests me the most in the story is not him. It's her. Because she could have, she could have been great. She painted also. We, we actually, my, my wife is here, we actually have a, a print of one of her paintings in our house, which she wouldn't let me put just anywhere in the house, but it, it's, in, it's, it's somewhere I can see it. But, it's, uh, but, but she was artistic. She wrote well in, in many cases, not Save Me the Waltz, was, ugh, but she wrote, um, she actually had uh, her, her own, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, she was an artist and had her own show in New York City or in Baltimore at one point. Um, so she was very, and she could dance. So she was very artistic and had huge potential. Um, but I, I guess the tragedy of her life 
just is just much more compelling than the tragedy of his. Because he really caused hers and caused his own too. Do you think Zelda would have still suffered from schizophrenia or mental stress if she had not married him? You know, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, th there are some writers who think, who certainly believe she was misdiagnosed, that probably she was, that nervous exhaustion exacerbated by the fact that she was drinking too much was really what uh, she was suffering from. And if, if they had never institutionalized her and treated her, because she underwent treatments that were in some cases barbaric, and it, it certainly diminished her capacity um, to, to be a light. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I, mean, I don't really know how to answer it. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but I, but I can tell you that uh, many people who are learned believed that that diagnosis ruined her life. One more, can we take one more? Why do they seem more popular now than they did in their own time? I have no idea. I don't know how to answer that question because, you know, his books went out of print for years and really were only revived, say, like around the 1960s. Um, but look, you know, if you read his other novels, they're, they're okay and they're symbolic of the time which we fantasize about a lot and we have great interest in and uh, we, of course, mythologize the 1920s. Uh, it was a very robust time in our country but, um, you know, it's hard to answer that question. But Great Gatsby is different from every one of his other novels. And it is much more simple, and it's much more symbolic, and it's much more accessible. Um, so, the, you know, the interest there, I, 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 don't, I don't really know how to answer it. I just know that that interest does exist, uh, certainly for a, a wide variety of people, because we saw a movie about it. And they seem to make a movie about it every 20 years or so, 30 years or so. So, Listen, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. And um, again, thank you to the foundation. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, thank you. And thank you for the uh, 4,050 people who showed up tonight in, in the auditorium. God bless. Thank you.